So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Joe Vogel. Good afternoon. Um, I'm getting kind of old, so I'm going to read my speech. If I don't do that, I'm going to forget some of the points, so I'm going to read mine. What I'm going to talk about is photographing Indian ruins from an airplane. But first, I want to share with you a little bit of information about myself, how I got into this Indian ruin business. My passion is flying. As long as I can remember, I wanted to be an airplane pilot. I applied for the Naval Air Cadet program while I was still in high school. I was turned down because I could not, I could not pass the eye test. My second passion turned out to be computers. In 1958, I started working with computers as an electrical engineer. I soon found out that my real calling was computer software. After a number of different companies, I wound up working for Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. There I developed computer software. The job and the pay was good. So in 1972, I bought my first airplane. It was a 1958 Beechcraft Bonanza, and that started a long and loving relationship that still exists today. In 1986, I retired from Kodak. In 1987, I moved to Prescott. In 1992, I became a site steward, and that was the beginning of my involvement with Indian Ruins. Sometime in 1999, Judy Taylor, the site coordinator for the Bumblebee area, sent me an email saying, there's this guy, David Wilcox. He would like to go flying. Now about this flying business. The basic rule is you don't see airplanes parked alongside the road with the hood up. To follow this rule, you need to know several things. They're going, uh, they are, where are you going? And how long are you going to be in the air? I didn't have answers to either of these questions, but I figured we would fly over the Agra Fria National Monument and be in the air for about an hour or so. So in August 1999, Judy Taylor, David Wilcox, and I met at the Prescott Airport. We got into my old friend, the Bonanza, and went flying. We flew over the Agra Fria National Monument. David pointed out some ruins. We flew over the foothills north of Phoenix. David pointed out more ruins. We flew north along the Verde River. David pointed out more ruins. Then we headed for the Verde Valley and the Brown Springs ruins. As we passed over the Brown Springs ruins, I noted two things. One, we had been in the air for three hours. And second, the needles on the fuel gauges were just above the yellow line. Then David said, can we go back to the Agrafia National Monument and the Brooklyn Basin area? I said yes, but then we would have to head back to Prescott because we were getting in the fuel reserve. At 180 miles per hour, it took only six or seven minutes to get to the area David had in mind. As we approached the Brooklyn Basin area, David said, fly up this canyon. So I did. And then I suddenly heard, walls! Thank goodness David had his seatbelt on. Had he not, he would have gone through the roof of the airplane. As we headed back to Prescott, we knew several things. David had spotted a new ruins. He would later name it Rosalie Lookout. 
and the airplane had proven itself as a useful tool for looking for Indian ruins. It also started a wonderful working relationship that continues today between David and myself. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about photographing Indian ruins. I do that with my second airplane. I'm crazy, I have two airplanes. My second airplane is called a Satabria. I call her Tabby. She has two seats, one behind the other. She was made in 1967. I bought her in 1998. It was a nostalgia purchase. She's the type of airplane I started to fly in in 1947. Tabby is not a very sophisticated airplane. In fact, she's kind of primitive. To get into Tabby, you have to be a gymnast. It is a combination of a pull-up, a twist, and a slide. The left foot has to wrap around a control stick. Then you let yourself down into the seat. Next, you strap yourself in. Once all the straps are buckled, you're not going anywhere. The cabin is only 27 inches wide. There is no room in front of you. The room in back of you is not accessible. You can't reach it. The only available room you have is on the floor besides your feet. The Indian ruins I plan to photograph are on a kneeboard that is strapped to my right leg. If Mother Nature is in a good mood, I might be able to write something down about the site I might be photographing. I also use it for writing down the air traffic control instructions. I have three pencils on me. I have another three in the flight case just behind the seat. If I drop a pencil, it's beyond reach. Should I drop all three, I will need to get a pencil from my flight case. I can't see the flight case, but I can feel it. I hope I can feel a pencil in there. Then there's the camera. It has a stabilizer attached to it. The stabilizer is about six inches long and four inches in diameter. There are two gyros inside this thing. They are spinning at 20,000 RPMs. Together they weigh 10 pounds. It's about as awkward and clumsy a combination as you can imagine. The camera rests on the floor besides my right foot. The kneeboard is just above it. Since I saw one of my telephoto lens fall a thousand feet to Mother Earth, the camera is tied to my seatbelt with a lanyard. Next to the lanyard is electrical cord that powers the gyro. That's what keeps the gyro spinning at 20,000 RPMs. So I take off. I fly to the first sight. I slow to 80 miles per hour. That's 35 meters per second. The sight is 1,000 feet below me. Tabby is bouncing up and down, moving sideways. She's dancing to the music provided by Mother Nature. I have no idea if it's a waltz or a polka, but she's dancing. I reach down and feel for the 10-pound camera besides my right foot. I lift it up and place it on my lap. Either the lanyard or the electrical cord knocks the kneeboard off. Both will bump the airplane's control wheel. One, of the, one or the other will push one of the 20 buttons on the camera. I have no idea which one has been pushed. After going through this several times, I knew I needed help. Then I remembered one of Kodak's slogans. It was, you press the button and leave the rest to us. So I looked around for the us, and sure enough, there was an us. They are Mr. Cannon, Mr. Kenyon, and Mr. Lawrence. After bringing these guys on board, the job got easy. Here's what I do now. I reach down and pick up the 10-pound camera. I still hit the kneeboard. I get the camera on my lap. I try to keep it there. The gyros are trying to move it elsewhere. I make sure the camera is set to full auto. That's the key to success. 
I start to circle the site. I have three to four seconds to get the photo. I lift the camera up, point it at the site. I look through the viewfinder. I try to center the site. Then I press the button. The rest is up to Mr. Cannon and Mr. Kenyon. So far, Mr. Cannon and Mr. Kenyon have taken over 7,000 digital photos and 1,500 film photos. As of yesterday, they have photographed exactly 893 sites. Yes, exactly, 893. Geronimo keeps track of that. Geronimo is the name of my computer. The other guy who plays a major role in all this is Mr. Lawrence. He runs the GPS. Every six seconds during the flight, he records the airplane's position. The entire flight from takeoff to circling the sites to landing back at the Prescott Airport is recorded. Then Geronimo, if he's in a good mood, will trace the entire flight on a map. I really don't do very much. The airplane flies by itself. The other guys take care of the photography and the GPS position. I just look down and marvel at the wide range of Indian ruins I see, and I see the trails and imagine Native Americans walking on them. And every so often, I get to shout, walls, just like David did when he spotted the Rosalie Lookout. In conclusion, the people who really do the aerial photography are Mr. Cannon, Mr. Kenyon, Mr. Lawrence, Geronimo, and Tabby. And what a pleasure it is to work with them. Thank you very much.